Goedemiddag, beste collega's. Bonjour, cher collega, bienvenue. Um, we compromis aan de België, we gaan uh, deze meeting in Engels. Uh, if you allow us to do so. <laughs> Sorry. Um, many thanks for joining us here in the room uh, and also online. Uh, I see there are uh, 100 people online and then uh, another 50 here in the room. So that's, that's great to see you all in so high numbers. Uh, and many more uh, Belgian colleagues who showed indeed their interest uh, when we did the survey last week. Um, apologies also for the, the technical difficulties in setting up this meeting. Uh, we had not expected so many people to participate, so that's why we had to reschedule a bit. But glad you could all make it. Um, I'm Tom de Smet. I'm the deputy head of the Commission representation in Belgium. And uh, I'm welcoming you behal on behalf of the team of the representation. For those who have not worked with us uh, so far, uh, the representations are in fact the, the network of DG communication in the different capitals, in the different member states. And we are the communication and liaison service uh, between the Commission and policymakers, civil society, industry, academia, education sector, media, uh, and the general public in the different member states. Uh, and in that sense, uh, we're also closely working indeed with the educational sector, with teachers, with schools, uh, which is uh, the main topic of today about uh, how to participate in the back to school or back to university initiative. Um, what is on the agenda of today? We have more or less one hour. Uh, we will present, uh, obviously, the Back to School, Back to University initiative. It will be presented by my colleague uh, Benjamin, who is sitting here uh, next to me. Uh, he is uh, the colleague in the representation dealing with education, and he's also your contact point for uh, any further questions later on. Um, but as this uh, back to school action is an initiative at the corporate level, uh, it's a commission wide. Uh, we also have our colleague from uh, DGCOM's headquarters, uh, Niklas uh, Noakson, who can uh, or who will also uh, help us in answering a couple of practical questions in the Q&A. Uh, after the presentation, we'll give uh, briefly the floor also to Isabel, another colleague from the representation who has done it a couple of times uh, and who will uh, share some of her practical experiences from past visits to, uh, to schools here in Belgium. Um, and after that, after the, the part on uh, back to school and the Q&A for this, we'll have uh, hopefully a bit of time uh, to talk uh, about other communication actions in which you as a colleague can be involved in which you can participate. Uh, we've seen in the survey that there is a very high interest uh, uh, among the colleagues to be part also in other initiatives and other actions and to um, act as an ambassador of the Commission, uh, an ambassador of the European Union uh, among the different constituencies here in Belgium. So that's great. But to start, uh, I will first give the floor to uh, the head of our representation, Stefan de Rink, who will briefly, briefly explain you why your involvement matters so much, and in particular for uh, the six coming months now. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Merci beaucoup. And I've also switched to English as the Compromis à la Belge continues. It's fantastic, first of all, to see so many colleagues uh, present in the room, but also online, and it's such a great interest. It's um, an enormous potential for us as representation, also as Commission more generally, to increase our communication capacity and for us 2024 will be certainly a, a very important year for communicating Europe, communicating candidate Europe as we say in DG communication in view of the elections but also in view of the presidency of, of the, that Belgium will have of the Council. Of course we are the Commission, this is um, this, the presidency is something that concerns another institution, the Council but it's certainly our experience in the past that a president of the country holding the presidency that that increases a lot of the potential to communicate about Europe and to explain what the European Union is and does to the public opinion in that country in this case in Belgium to the media to stakeholders to local governments we certainly in the representations already feel that, that there is a greater interest from a variety of stakeholders and public administrations to do things on the European Union because of the fact that the Belgian authorities have the presidency of, of the Council. So there is a lot of more potential for us to be effective in terms of communicating what the European Commission is and what it does and what we stand for. 
And then, of course, there's the, the election to which I, I will come back. On the presidency itself, uh, a bit of context here, a bit of political context. Of course, this is the presidency that comes at the end of our mandate as in this commission, it is von der Leyen commission, von der Leyen one, who knows. Um, and so one of the tasks, and the Belgians are very pragmatic about that, is to finish as many dossiers as possible in the council by constructing a general approach or, or in the trilogues between the parliament and the council. The key priorities there, most likely the budget review, let's see what happens in the European Council, but that may continue. The review of the stability and growth pact, and so the new rules on deficit, debt, government spending, the European semester issues. Uh, migration and asylum will be a very important topic. Perhaps the Spanish presidency will almost finish it or nearly or perhaps finish it fully in the most optimistic scenario. But then the implementation of that pact will be also very important. And that's also a priority of the Belgian federal government is to kickstart a coordinated implementation of the migration and asylum package. There's quite a bit of issues still in the, in the environment field, also in the fit for 55 electricity market design. You remember the whole discussion, which was very hot in Belgium as well, about the link between the gas price and electricity price. As a follow up to that, the commission made a proposal. Um, and more broadly, post COP28, the benchmarks for the 2040 CO2 emissions. Uh, we are fit for 55 by 2030, climate neutral by 2050. A very important and sensitive topic for the Belgians will be what the Commission will propose as a 2040 benchmark. And that's also awaited with great interest. In a broader context of, and that's my final point on policies, where the Prime Minister and the regional governments too, by the way, but the Prime Minister in particular wants to put industrial policy at the heart of the EU agenda. So after a few years of the Green Deal, he wants us as a commission and to come back to one of the original pillars of that Green Deal, which is that it's also a growth strategy. That's also what the commission wants. And one of the issues that under the Belgian presidency will hopefully find conclusion to is the Net Zero Industry Act, which is an act that defines a number of critical technologies for renewable energy and a number of other issues where we need to become more sovereign as the European economy single market, basically. All very important issues and it's becoming even more important in view of the elections to have this presidency because the Belgian government and the Prime Minister de Croo also wants to make a mark on the thinking about the future of the European Union and that's mainly for what will happen in the few weeks of the presidency after the 9th of June, so after the elections. Belgium has the task to help Charles Michel put a strategic agenda for the Council together, which has to be adopted in June by the European Council. But Belgium wants to go beyond that. And in view of the enlargement issue, Ukraine, Moldova and other countries, wants to start a more strategic reflection on the budget, the policies, and the institutional functioning of the European Union in light of, of that enlargement. So that's all very important background, political background to our communication challenges um, that we have ahead of us. Um, for us in the representation, schools and back to school takes on an extra importance also in view of these elections, because as you may know, the 16 to 18 year old Belgians are allowed to vote as uh, in the June 2024 elections. So whoever is 16 on the 9th of June 2024 or 17 or not yet 18 can actually vote. It's not compulsory, uh, which is different for the plus 18 year olds, but it is optional. And that's therefore an important challenge. And we are working with our colleagues in the European Parliament Liaison Office to mobilize those 16 to 18 year olds. Because if the participation rate of that age group is low, it's not compulsory, that would be no doubt portrayed by many as the young people do not care about Europe. So it is a big challenge to make sure that that participation rate is very high. And there, of course, our actions with schools are, are absolutely fundamental. Um, we have a regional and federal elections at the same time, and usually that eclipses the attention given to the European elections. 
So it's our task and our common task and also your contribution to that will be incredibly valuable in many different ways that you can think of, but also in terms of contact with schools to make sure that we find ways to mobilize the 16 to 18 year olds to make sure that they are aware that they can go and vote and that they are also aware that there are European elections and not just federal and regional elections. Um, your task is also very important for something that mm, probably Isabel will also touch a word on that, is that when we show that we are actually humans and not just Eurocrats, people change often their minds on what the European Union is and what the Commission does. It's often as simple as that. To make a human connection with people can often change how people think about the European Union, just by showing who we are, that we also have hobbies and passions and not just professionals, but that we also believe passionately in European integration. But beyond that, that we also would like to interact uh, on a voluntary basis with kids in schools or people in universities or different environments. That's just an important act as such, and that's an important communication act and, and as such. And I think uh, and that's my final word and also in terms of you going back to certain educational institutions, schools or others. I think it's very important for us also as representation to keep in mind that we want to keep in touch with those schools. It's not just a one-off kind of thing that we like to do. It's also an opportunity to start a, a relationship with schools and university departments and other school, school institutions. So I think that's also something very important for us to keep in mind. Um, with that, I pass the floor back to you, Tom, for the rest of the proceeding. Just, I, I won't be able to stay, I'm sorry, just to say that. I, I'm very interested to see how this meeting goes, and then we'll, my colleagues will debrief me, but I am not able to stay, unfortunately. So, But thank you for your enthusiasm and your, and your presence today. Thank you, Stefan. Um, yes, let's uh, move uh, straight into the topic of the back to school, back to university. And, uh, the, my colleague uh, Benjamin will uh, explain you uh, everything about the program, how it works, uh, and what to do to take part in this. So good afternoon, everybody. I'm Benjamin, and I will uh, lead you today through the information session, give you all the information you need to know about how to participate and to apply to do a back to school. Before I start with the more technical aspects, uh, I will uh, give you some uh, information about the most frequently asked questions. Because those last weeks, we received a lot of demand and information about the back to school. One of those was, uh, who is eligible to do a back to school? Answer is quite easy. All EU staff can apply. Blue book trainees can apply. We can even retire EU staff member under certain, uh, I would say, conditions can apply to. As uh, is it quite obvious, external contractors do not uh, come into consideration uh, to apply, as are uh, atypical uh, trainees. Second question uh, that we received uh, was, am I obliged to go to the school where I graduated? And the answer is no, you can choose the school that you want. If there is a school next to you uh, at home or school of your kids, you can go there and, and apply. Last question uh, that we had was, am I obliged to go to the school or can I do it virtually? So a virtual meeting is also considered a back to school. Afterwards, for some obvious reason, I would not recommend it because you lose the interaction with the kids and, and the teachers. But in worst case, you never know what happened. Instead of canceling your back to school, you can still do it uh, virtually. Now, let me explain you uh, the step-by-step -step guide on how uh, to proceed with uh, your participation in the back to school. So first of all, you need to know that back to school is not only a program for the European Commission, but other uh, EU institutions and EU agencies can also participate uh, at the back to school. Every 
DG has also its own coordinator. It means that next to me we have chance to have uh, Niklas, who is the coordinator for uh, DGCOM. Uh, those coordinators, you will be able to find them in the SharePoint, in the link I have put just under here in the first slide. So once you click on the link, you arrive at the uh, SharePoint site, and you see just under you have rep coordinators, other institutions, and EC uh, DG coordinators. The most interesting for us is the left one. And there you see you have names. You have, for example, uh, Agri, uh, Connect, Clima. You see the name, email address, phone number. Should you have any questions and that you're working in this DG about uh, the back to school, feel free to contact them and they will be more than happy to help you. Why do we have in each DG a special coordinator the answer is, is quite simple it's because every dg has its own rules uh, regarding the back to school so you see this slide is quite interesting because you can see depending on your dg uh, you're working for if you get reimbursements of any costs uh, a daily allowance travel costs or travel cost and a daily allowance once you, you can, uh, collected all this information, the next step to do is to ask the approval of the line manager. If you say, I really want to do the back to school, contact your line manager and you wait for his green lights to start uh, the research for a school. Once that is done, you can uh, again go on this SharePoint and you have what it's called a country page. And on the country page, you will see uh, it's actually a small Belgian flag. Once you click on it, you will have a lot of information that you can use to uh, start the search for a school. So, for example, you have an introduction letter that will be available in French, Dutch and German. You have online presentations, so you have PowerPoint presentations that you can use as example to start uh, your own presentation. You have also the possibility, once uh, you have finalized your presentation and that you say, okay, I went uh, for the back to school, everything was fine, that you feel for yourself that your presentation was top, you can add it on the SharePoint so that other people can use it uh, and get inspiration of your work. So as you see here, you've got this uh, Belgium flag once you click on it, you arrive at Belgium core materials. You have the introduction letters for schools, for universities, and the power presentation uh, I just mentioned. So feel free, like I said, once you uh, made your own presentation, if you say that, okay, it's of good quality, upload it, and it will be very useful for uh, your fellow colleagues. Here we can find uh, an example of the letter that you can send to the school. Here you have it, uh, the Dutch version. You will just have to adapt some names, but the core text is already done for you. What you see here is actually very nice for people who want to be proactive. That says, I want to do a back to school and I want to search the school myself. So you have two types of, of colleagues. You have the one that are going to do everything alone and going to fill in the letter, send it, and do it on my own. And you have the second type that says, I'm interested in the program, but I have no time to send the letter. Don't worry. What we will do once we send the presentation in a couple of days, you will receive a survey. You can actually register yourself, so that you can be put on a list, which means that when we have uh, a demand uh, from a school, from a uh, Europe Direct Center to get uh, a colleague to do a presentation, we can find you, we can contact you and ask you, we received uh, a demand from school X, are you interested to do it or not? Once the letter uh, is sent and that you have uh, the appointment with the school, 
you can fill in uh, the calendar. It's also uh, an item that you find on the SharePoint. You have the five steps of uh, successfully editing uh, the calendar, and you have the Excel sheet under, in which I will show you when you open it. You can fill in your name, back to school, university, uh, the date of your visit. Uh, is it a physical one or a virtual one? Your uh, email address, institution, position. Once uh, that is done, you can start to uh, collect the information for your presentation and also to not forget to fill in the MIPS. So fill in the MIPS, the MIPS uh, plus, sorry, for uh, your mission order. And then you can start to see actually with the teacher which type of topics you can present when you go back to school. Because you can say, I want to talk about the institution, the elections, or, or whatever, but at the end, he's going to be the one to say, no, I want you to come to talk about the institutions, but I would like to have more information about the Green Deal. I want a session about the Green Deal. I want a session about energy. So check uh, with the teacher, define the topics, and then just under, you can find all uh, links that can be useful uh, for you, like the learning corner, where you can find some uh, quiz, some uh, publications with information. Uh, for example, the Coesio uh, link is very nice. If you want to give an example of what does uh, Europe do in my region. So when you click on it, you can click on uh, Flemish re region, uh, Walloon, yeah, you click and you see in all the communes what uh, type of uh, investments and in, that uh, Europe did uh, in this part. Also, what is important, uh, I would say, as you give the presentation, is to use a Slido and, and to interact with the, the students. But don't give the presentation and stay there during one hour and talk about Europe because don't forget that it's still there are still students. So if you, if you can let them participate by using, for example, uh, Slido, so it can be interactive. They can use their phone. You can ask questions. Do not hesitate if you don't use the Slido to just ask random questions uh, when you are talking to involve them. And last but not least, I would say enjoy the moment because it's. Uh, I did it last week for the first time, and it was really, it's a fantastic experience. So we now pass the floor to Niklas. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Benjamin. Uh, so I'm Niklas. I'm from uh, uh, Digicom Centrally, and not from the representation. Uh, I'm working the, in the unit uh, networks in member states. And we're also responsible for coordinating the back to school, back to university centrally, meaning that I'm uh, reaching out to all the uh, back to school coordinators in the representations, uh, all the back to school coordinators in the director generals, uh, in, uh, also in executive agencies of the commission and even beyond uh, with parliament council and other EU institutions. Um, so just a few uh, more points on what we have in, in store for you. Uh, during next year. Um, uh, first of all, we are expecting some new material. We have the SharePoint. Some of you might have seen it. It's a refurbished SharePoint. It's very easily navigated. It's very intuitive. It's really, um, if you go there, it should be the good starting point if you would like to plan your, uh, your back to school, both in terms of administrative part, but also when you prepare uh, your presentation. Um, but in, in addition to that, we have a few new uh, things coming up uh, in 2024. Uh, we have this flyer, uh, which is a one pager, which will be targeting first time voters. It will be targeting um, uh, the young in, in their kind of own, in the language which they maybe resonate better with. Um, and it will be uh, available in all languages. So this could be useful uh, to bring along uh, if you go back to school. Uh, in, in particular, because this is for, for the ones who are probably a bit younger than around 17, 18. And then, of course, uh, we are also, we have a lot, uh, as Benjamin said, on the Belgian page, you have PowerPoint presentations, more corporate ones, 
but we will also have a new, um, more targeted for the uh, parliament elections uh, from, um, it will be a Digicom in-house product, uh, which will be, yes, uh, of course, quite useful in the run-up to the European elections to explain uh, various points uh, in, in that perspective. And then, of course, we have the European Parliament. They have, you might know, they have together.eu. They have a website where you can find quite some material already. But when it comes to really explaining um, the elections, how you go to vote, what are the options in terms of uh, political choices, political parties, we expect that they will produce material in the beginning of next year, uh, which could also be uh, uh, useful for, for, for most of us, I would say. Next slide. And then a few uh, just important uh, links. Um, so this first one is a step-by-step step -by -step guide, which you, which you will find quite easily if you go to the SharePoint on the landing page. There is a big image for this step-by-step -step guide. And if you just click into that, it will really uh, guide you through quite easily uh, with links to the next step where you fill in things and you go, if you just follow these steps, uh, you will easily uh, uh, arrive at the ending end point quickly. Uh, and Benjamin mentioned uh, you ha have uh, DG, um, DG's back to school coordinators and they know the terms and conditions which apply in your DG. So it's really important to, to find out uh, what kind of financial coverage you have, how many days you can use for going back to school, um, and so on and so forth. Um, and if you don't find the answers in your back to school coordinator, of course, you can come to, to me, to Digicom as well, and, and we will be happy to help. Um, the calendar, uh, which was mentioned also in the presentation, is extremely important. It's the way we monitor how many people uh, are going from different DGs, from, the, from, from different countries and so on and so forth. So it's extremely important that you fill in this so we, we have an overview of what's really happening. And uh, finally, after your visit uh, in the school, in the university, there's a very short uh, EU survey, uh, which we ask you to fill in, is simply to say uh, what went through very well and if some, something went less well and also your feedback so we can uh, always try to improve the program. Finally, this is, um, yeah, I wanted to show you, this is something we have produced in my unit not so long time ago. We call it a synoptic map. It's the first time that we map all, uh, let's say, local offices relating to the EU on the ground. So the dots are, looks quite few, but they are actually thousands. Uh, if you zoom in, you will see quite, quite a lot more. Um, and these are then different centers relating to DGs, different DGs. But also we have our own, let's say, from Digicom, the, what was mentioned earlier, Europe Direct Centers and European Documentation Centers. So here I simply clicked in those. Um, but I was wondering if we can go live. If you click on this link, yeah, if we go back. Can you click on this? Maybe not. Oh, okay. But the link is in. Uh, yeah, shared. okay, but uh, it, it's shared, the link. So what happens is you click on the link and then you just fill in Belgium and you get all the dots for these two centers. And if you just zoom, on, zoom in on the map, you will see more centers appearing. And then if you know where you want to go, you can reach out to those centers. You simply click the, click the small dot where you want to go, where you have a center, and you have all the uh, contact details, telephone number, email, web page, and they are ready uh, and they're available to help if you need help to find a school as well. So this is a resource uh, which please make use of it. Uh, and with this, um, I'll leave the floor back to Benjamin. So now I will introduce you to my colleague Isabel, who is going to uh, give us and tell us our, our experience uh, as she did several back to schools. In the meantime, we see some questions already in the chat. Uh, so colleagues, if you have more questions, please post them in the chat. And for those in the room, we'll take them uh, after uh, Isabel's intervention. Thanks. So, uh, hello, everyone. So I'm Isabel. Um, I actually, um, I studied to become a teacher. So um, it's true that I feel quite comfortable in front of a classroom. However, the first thing I want to tell you is that you can go there really um, 
without any presentation, not being worried because uh, what the teacher needs is really your feedback, your input, and most of the information, you know them, really. Uh, trust me. On the other side is make Europe fun in the classroom because I think that uh, back to school is not about replacing the teacher or the professor. They do a good job most of the time. It's really about sharing unusual stuff. So I give you here, I have two examples. Uh, I strongly advise and recommend that you give a call to the teacher before you go there, just you know to know the level of your students, of the classroom. So I've done uh, a few back to schools. I'm also hosting groups here some, from time to time. Um, the first one I did was in my primary school, which was quite cool. And I didn't arrive with a PowerPoint, but I arrived with my little magic bag and we did a treasure hunt on Europe. Actually, the only example I want to give you, because we are all Belgians here in the room, is kind of cool treasure. I ask the pupils or the teacher to take a coin, coin from their pocket if they have one, or you prepare the classroom. And I said that, did you know that there is one little Belgium symbol on all EU coins? I suppose you all know that, right? Say yes. <laughs> okay, so in case you don't know, the guy that created the EU coins is a Belgian one. His name is Luc Lux, and he puts his two initials on every coin. And this is really, I mean, this is a small thing, but it makes everything look like really wonderful for the kids, especially primary school. What they like is about talking about uh, cultural difference. Uh, yeah, I mean, what we have in Europe, what makes us rich, actually, everything that's linked to culture, food, languages, mm -hmm. and more. And what I really like in primary school is that you have loads of interaction, so no issue with the engagement there. But when you go to secondary school, it starts becoming a little more difficult to have interactions. So I think that most of the time it's uh, quite good to start from their interests. So um, one of the back to school I did uh, was in a professional school uh, for uh, future design creators. And I came with the campaign actually from our colleagues from DG Environment, which is a, a very cool campaign. Reset the trend, it's talking about slow fashion and how Europe actually um, is really in there already in the schools, in the designer schools now to put that green aspect in uh, everything linked to fashion. And when you start that conversation, of course, after, it's easier to explain what the commission does, what the parliament does, why it's important to vote and to show other examples. So always good to start with their point of interest. Sometimes it's quite tough, you know, to have interaction, but most of the time it works quite well. And um, because I saw one question already, I'm always happy to share. Uh, and I said to Benjamin, I promised him that I will upload some of the presentation I've done. And if you need advice or good tips, I'm very happy to share it with you. Thank you, Isabel. Uh, maybe I'll uh, give you already a first question also from the chat. How do you deal with uh, tricky questions or negative remarks when they arise in the class? So I, th I think that um, I, my goal is not to convince anyone. This is also something that I say very clearly to every teacher. I said, uh, I don't want you to become pro-Europe or against Europe. I mean, it's just like uh, giving a kind of balance between what they know what they probably don't know. Um, and on the other hand, also showing that, you know, we are also Belgium citizen and we don't always agree with everything that we do here. So it's also fine sometimes to give your own opinion, saying that it's my own opinion, but okay, so that they know and they feel connected to you in some ways. But most of the time, I mean, even tricky questions, uh, you can really answer them with, with as I said, balanced answer. It's true that the Green Deal will not solve all the issues we have, but at least it's already one big step ahead talking about green, for instance. So, Thank you. Uh, and from my experience, it, it, there's nothing wrong with saying that certain things 
there are certain areas about which you, you cannot comment because you're only working in one specific DG or on one specific uh, type of files. So uh, people do accept that. Uh, on the other hand, it's also good and interesting to hear the remarks and the concerns and to just by the fact that you listen to them and that you acknowledge them uh, and tell them that you take note of it, it's already, it helps for the young people that they, uh, at least they can vent to someone in real life and not just uh, posting uh, very nasty comments on social media. Uh, and that's how, how you, you very often can get a conversation uh, if you broaden it up, if you ask uh, other people in the class whether they agree, disagree, how they see it, what they would propose as a solution. It often helps uh, for uh, those areas where maybe we don't have the answer immediately or we don't have the answer at all as a commission. Uh, but a conversation as such uh, never, never uh, harms, of course. <laughs> Um, I see some, some other questions here in the chat, and I'll, uh, I'll uh, turn those to uh, Benjamin and, uh, and Nicolas. Uh, one tip coming from Antoinette in Skik, it's quite similar to what uh, Isabel just said, is indeed uh, to make it human and show um, how the EU impacts our daily lives by showing things from your own handbag, uh, what uh, Europe does when it comes to, to smartphones, to the safety of lip lipsticks to the bottle of water, the phone charger, uh, you name it. Uh, you have plenty of examples here. Uh, so um, it's indeed uh, it's often a matter of making it tangible and very visible and concrete for, for the people in, in real life. Uh, then from other questions, all material will be shared, of course, uh, uh, including also the links to all the SharePoints. In case you have difficulties with access accessing the SharePoint links, uh, please flag it. Uh, and normally uh, DigiCom should be able to, to grant you access to those. There are a couple of questions specifically from colleagues in delegations, commission staff working in delegations uh, in the houses of the EES. Uh, can they participate? How does it work? Uh, Niklas? Yes, um, indeed, thank you for this question. Yes, uh, if you work in delegations, of course, you can also participate, uh, being, being um, European uh, commission staff. Uh, that's always the case, and it's also we also encourage uh, this kind of uh, new mindset to combine uh, back to school, back to university with telework from abroad. Uh, or if you have an existing mission, you add one or two days before or after for back to school, or even combining with your holidays. So this is uh, probably what we increasingly need to do, all of us, uh, since the, the greening policy of the Commission will not will not extensively allow. Uh, I would say not uh, more uh, coverage for travel, but rather less in the future. Uh, so this is something we have to cope with, and but still uh, maintain and, and support uh, this program. Thank you. Quite a few questions also on uh, the material available, but all those links will be shared as well, uh, together with the good examples that we have. Uh, a question from Sandra and Echo, uh, does it, uh, is, is it wise to talk about yourself, about your career, uh, Isabel? Well, it depends. Um, for instance, I'm dealing with social media, the representation, and it's true that when you meet students in journalism or communication, it's cool to share your experience. But when you go to a primary school, I mean, I not really talk about my career, except saying that I was in the same school because, for instance, the first picture that you see there, it's, it was in my school in Molenbeek and it was quite cool to be back. <laughs> so it's, I was proud to say that I was sitting exactly at that chair, but for the rest, I mean, didn't make really sense for children from 12 years old. Any questions in the room here? Please raise your hand. Not immediately. In the chat, there is uh, also a colleague. Yes, uh, also a colleague asking whether it's limited to only one school where you can go, or there are no limitations. I understand. As long as you get the uh, the approval from your line manager, you can go as often and to any place you want. Also outside Belgium, eh, to be clear. Benjamin? If I may, you can uh, do several schools, but if you get an allowance, it's just for one visitor. If I, uh, mm. With uh, with the allowance, um, if you manage to do more visits, it's, it's encouraged still. Uh, so uh, um, the allowance, the rules for allowance says that you have uh, two days maximum. Now we are in Belgium, so travel two days, probably you're 
quite too much outside <laughs> of Belgium. But uh, okay, half a day, uh, daily allowance could be in some cases probably applicable. Uh, but if you go um, mm, to more schools, especially in different geographical areas, you can get up to two days. This is also again EU wide, so maybe not fully applicable to, to Belgium. Uh, but definitely you can go to more visits and it's encouraged indeed, yeah. Voila. <laughs> good, good afternoon, everybody. A very simple question. Based on, on your experience, uh, how long should this visit take place? An hour, an hour and a half, two hours? And the second question is, uh, since I'm from Brussels and was at school in Brussels, do I go into MIPS or is it just for people who travel? Thanks. To the, to the MIPS question there, or to travel, uh, if you if you live in Brussels, you don't need to encode anything in MIPS for this uh, very short distance. I think that uh, session of 15. Sorry, 15 minutes, a normal class hour is okay. Sometimes, you know, when you say that you come, most of the teachers try to gather, you know, like geography, history, uh, history classes, and then they gather, but it truly recommend 50 minutes. It's already very good if, uh, you know, they listen to you. Even if you want interaction, they do like 20 minutes presentation, 30 minutes of talk. It's cool. If I might, we have also at the rep some games that we can borrow you uh, if you want to go to a school. We have, for example, uh, Route Europa for students uh, between 16 and 18 to explain them why it is important to go and, and, and vote uh, in June. So if you have a game like that, you can combine it with one hour to so 15 minutes of explanation and then maybe one hour of playing the game with them. So it really depends on what you want to, to offer. The idea is indeed that you tailor your visit uh, in dialogue with the school that is hosting you. Uh, so it could be indeed a one hour thing, it can be half a day, it can be with games or not. Uh, likewise, by the way, for uh, there was a question in the chat for colleagues who want to go to university, uh, there check in, well in advance what the purpose is, uh, whether it's a general presentation about the Commission, about the European Union, or if they want to go deeper into a specific policy file. If the latter is the case, obviously you may feel less comfortable if it's not your, your domain of expertise. In that case, uh, contact us and we can see whether there is another colleague who can step in. Uh, so that's that's uh, quite obvious. Um, also, some a, a very interesting uh, conversation in the chat about whether there are boring jobs in the Commission. Uh, some people are afraid that uh, they have uh, not enough funny things to say. Uh, but there, I, I believe, also from my, my own experience, uh, that every job uh, triggers some interest and curiosity among young people. The fact that you work for the Commission and be it in communications, in finance, in pol on policy files, on whatever, it, it helps the moment you talk as a convinced uh, European Commission official. Uh, it, it works well and you, you get a, a dialogue and a conversation. So there, there are plenty of good examples on no matter what your profile is on, uh, of, of colleagues who, who managed to, to do it in a very inspiring way. Uh, I see online uh, Sandra uh, Goffin from ECHO who wants to uh, come in. I hope it will work sound-wise, but please try. Yes, uh, thank, thank you. Thank you very much. No, I just wanted to ask, I mean... The Sorry, problem, Sandra, we can't hear you. You can't hear me. Uh, okay. I'll put I'll put it in the chat. No, but she, she's you are unmuted, but we can't hear you. No worries. Just give us a second, Sandra. I will try it here with the central IT system. Other questions in the room? The work, I mean, if the thing is like the presentation is 50 minutes, but I get a whole day off. <laughs> I mean, just wondering if that's really the case, because obviously, I mean, 
I'm not sure my line manager would approve with that. While I still want to do the, obviously the presentation, but then obviously I guess I can still work and just take like two hours or something, right? Or how does that work? I think it's a it's a valid question. Uh, I went back as well uh, this spring, had a similar similar situation, and it also depends because after we, I had my presentation, then there was uh, the local uh, press was invited for an interview. And before and after, perhaps you speak a bit with the teacher. So time passes. It's not really, I wouldn't say it's 50 minutes in total. It's probably half a day or so, uh, depending on your situation. And we also encourage, if you, if you can, in, in collaboration with the teacher, to invite uh, some local newspaper just in this neighborhood. So it gets some multiplier effects. It's something we also support, so pe more people can, can follow. But what I did is simply I opened my computer the rest of the day and worked. But, uh, I think it's, it's it's just a common sense how how you would like to do it. So you so. say. Thanks. And then the same for traveling. Like I get a travel day, but I mean the flight is two hours. Or how does that work? I, I think the 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 keyword is you get a maximum uh, of two days, and then it's depending on on your travel. We also see uh, quite some examples of uh, people doing a back to school and visiting several classes in the same school in the same day, uh, just to combine it. Uh, first, uh, over here. Good afternoon. Thank you for the presentation. I'm Vanessa Caperso from the TG Group. Um, I, I have a question regarding um, the, the election, because I think it's a very important point. And uh, our mission will be also to motivate the kids between 16 and 18 to vote. And I was wondering if you have a presentation that we could use, some slide that we could use with key arguments that we could put forward. That would be very useful. Thanks. So um, I have I have already uh, something prepared that can help you. Now, to be really honest with you, um, most of the let's say the teenager that that we that I meet, they very confused. Like you know, they don't get it why you need to vote for federal election the same day and then regional and then European. So it's good to make a clear statement on what's happening at different level. So it's true that it's a little bit it's not that fun to be honest, but it's nice to give practical examples. So, uh, and also, as I said, always good to, to put it again in their daily life. And what I see now, for instance, in the French speaking part of the country, uh, uh, young, they get really targeted by uh, lots of politicians, also coming from France, actually extreme left. They're quite good in promoting themselves. I don't know how they get that far into the country. So it's always good, you know, to, to give them example about maybe what you can find on social media, because it's true that this is what they see, what they hear. Uh, and Good afternoon. I'm just coming back on your remark uh, about the interview. Um, I do believe, because you're a DG Com, right? And um, aren't there some particular rules about contact with the press? Yeah. Those rules, they are clearly uh, spelled out on the intranet as well. You can find them there. Uh, but indeed, for all media engagements, uh, you, unless you are authorized to, by definition to, to talk to the media, which is just uh, for official spokespeople, directors general, heads of representation, uh, you need a prior authorization. So if you are indeed aware uh, that there might be a journalist showing up, a local journalist or whoever, uh, you and you're working for a line DG, in that case it's best to contact your communication unit who can get the clearance uh, with the SPP, uh, with the spokesperson's uh, service, uh, and make sure that you're covered uh, or to give you a certain steering guidance. Uh, in, in practice, it, it, it's very often granted without uh, a lot of discussion as long as you stick to some basic rules, that you're, uh, you're not giving any political statements, you're not talking on behalf of the Commission, but you're just giving your personal experience as a, as a staff member and so on. So there are some basic rules to, to respect um, and uh, it's definitely indeed important to, to get this prior uh, authorization for that. Um, what if unexpected, maybe it's good to just immediately ask already for this prior, um, because if, if unexpectedly some local uh, um, press is there, 
It's it's good to, to to check it in advance if you can indeed, and if it happens and you don't do not have the clearance, uh, then at that point just make it clear to the journalist that uh, you will need to get this authorization. And you will get back to him or her uh, afterwards if needed. Yes. Sorry. <laughs> Please go ahead. I'm Fabienne Dejeinpa. Uh, I'm not going to travel for this, but I would like to do that close to home. Uh, I live in an area with lots of schools and I have two, two teenage kids, so that will be easy. Um, just a question, do you have a list of the schools where it already has been done? Just to, or is that actually not important? And then the same question on MIPS. I mean, if I do this close by home, I suppose I don't need to put anything. Uh, I don't, it's like the Brussels lady, except that it's not in Brussels, but somewhere else. I suppose I don't have to put it in, uh, in the system neither. Indeed, if there's no travel, there's no MIPS to be done. Uh, MIPS is also important uh, in terms of insurance, of course. It's not only the travel costs. Uh, so there it, it might be interesting to still to market. Uh, on uh, your first question, uh, sorry. Uh, which schools? Yeah, for that, indeed, that's exactly the purpose of this Excel table that was shown in the presentation, where everything is tracked on who goes where. Uh, so there you can see also going back from previous months uh, uh, which schools already were visited by whom and so on. Please. Yes, I'm Catherine from Olaf, so I'm going to have like a fancy thing to, to present. Uh, but I'm also, I'm surrounded by a lot of teenagers. And the first thing that comes to my mind when I see this, maybe I missed it in the presentation, but do we have any, how would I say, like... Uh, fast presenting interactive things like uh, Instagram videos, something to show them and to launch them, because I find that we, we drag their attention. I mean, I could, I, I could imagine myself going to teenagers or rem reminding myself when I was a teenager, uh, I definitely would get more attention just to give a nice dynamic things. I'm also coming from the parliament originally, and I'm wondering if, the par if you're connecting with the parliament, because I, I suspect the parliament probably has developed quite some videos or something, but something that would be like fast, like Snapchat, funny, whatever. And also, do we have um, there one question? I saw those fancy pencils and I'm like, do we have any material, post-it things, whatever marketing material we can give to them? Or do we have anything? Because when I see the 16, 17 people around me, um, I know I could get them to say, oh, you know, there's that... Um, uh, Instagram channel or something that, you know, they, they could be curious for fast, fancy, funny, whatever, something like that to learn about those things. But we need to really have something to catch them fast. No. That? <laughs> um, actually, uh, I suppose you don't follow EU for BE. <laughs> so we have a, a wonderful Instagram channel where uh, me and my team, we working quite hard on creating loads of stuff from which we quite not famous enough yet. But you see that we have loads of fun and very, I mean, catchy 90 seconds material. And we even managed to have engagement around State of the Union this year, which is, I think, uh, a very good achievement. <laughs> so yes. EU for B. EU for we'll, me. We'll but back. yeah, we'll come back to that after. In, in a couple of minutes, yes. Uh, shall we still give it a try to Sandra also uh, online to see whether it works? I, I Can you hear me now? Yes, perfect. Thanks. Okay, no, I in the meantime, I put my question in the chat. It was just actually to understand for which age range the PowerPoint, PowerPoint presentation have been conceived? Because I think it's very different to address primary, secondary, university student. It's, it's very different. So I was just wondering what was um, the idea in the, in, the, in the PowerPoint presentation? Thanks. Yes. So on the SharePoint, uh, in the Belgian folder, uh, we have uploaded already various uh, versions for different age groups. Uh, different angles uh, and the purpose that's also a bit a call to all of you is that if you would adapt it or tailor it or, or develop your own presentations and you feel that it works you can also upload them on the SharePoint and put them at the disposal of the other colleagues so so they can uh, be inspired by your uh, your creative work uh, yes and uh, just also just to let you know we created really adapted material in French and Dutch 
For primary, it's called Europe Plus Ensemble, Europa Mersame. And for secondary school, I would recommend EU and Me, because there you really have, I mean, everything that you need. And, and the last thing, uh, don't stick to a PowerPoint. If you're not in a meeting, just go there and talk. Don't worry about PowerPoint or any other stuff. Just be there. Thank you, Gaëtan from TechSuite. <clears throat> One advice and maybe two suggestions to you. The advice for everyone is to call way in advance the school to prepare it so that you're not just one intervention in a course. Uh, I did this some years ago and there it was very nice because I could call them you know, several weeks or months in advance. And so they had prepared the students in their courses. All the students who were there, they were ready with questions. And we spent almost an entire day in front of 100 plus students from the last year of the, uh, you know, the, of the Athenium school. And uh, in particular, leadership type of, uh, type of settings by tables where they were exchanging, et cetera. So prepare this in advance and it's, you know, this, is, this is more, uh, more useful then. The two suggestions I have maybe for you is we may get tricky questions because they are political nature or technical nature. And it might be nice for us to say, you know, we get back to you and that we actually get back to them. And there the question is whether there would be a way to coordinate those questions or ever, you know, have a frequently asked questions or something that, you know, where we get your help instead of us trying to fish within the commission to get these, uh, these answers. And the second, um, second suggestion is the inviters, it would be nice to invite them. I know they are visits of the commission. And so, you know, they, they could have a follow up here by coming to Brussels and, and visiting. Yeah, on the last point, we'll come back in a minute. Uh, on uh, the lines to take, as we call it, uh, indeed a very good one. Um, if you have doubts on specific things, and it's a very valid point to come back to them indeed afterwards, uh, there again, your communication unit in your DG has access uh, to all lines that are of, of the hottest topics or, or the, the most uh, recurrent questions. Uh, there are also a couple of sources on, on the more uh, uh, long-term issues eh, on, on accountability, the level of democracy, uh, whether we're too expensive and so on. For that, we also have some sources, including on, on the representations website, that can help you to, uh, to prepare for those, because they very often come, come up. Maybe one last question, oh, still a lot of them. <laughs> uh, one, because it's almost three o'clock and we still want to have five minutes for, for a, a very short other thing, please. But we can come back to yours, uh, Barlet Schlieff. Thank you very much. I'm um, Diaz from DG Connect. Um, courses like history, geography, typically uh, taught in ISO. I'm not sure what the French uh, speaking uh, equivalent is. Um, do we also reach uh, kids, uh, uh, students in BES or TES or from a more vulnerable uh, background? Uh, thank you. Uh, yes, absolutely. So the program is open for all kind of schools, and uh, indeed, it's uh, that's the risk with the, this proactive approach. That when you go back to your own school, it's very often it will be an uh, uh, ISO level school. Uh, but we do get requests uh, more spontaneous, spontaneously through our Europe Direct network, for instance, uh, our information centres in the different provinces, who get requests from schools from these more uh, technical vocational training programmes. Uh, and there it is indeed also uh, the, our task to find speakers who can go there. I did it myself a month ago, 14-year-old uh, uh, auto mechanics and, and uh, all kind of technical uh, profiles. Uh, did not have a clue about the union, about uh, political sciences, whatever. Uh, so it was quite challenging, <laughs> I can admit. Uh, but still there it was a matter indeed of, of again going back to their daily lives and to explain them, okay, we, we have a green deal, but what does it mean, your, the greening of your car, electrification and so on. So those were topics that, um, that were closer to, to, to their interests and, and then you, you could still go into a conversation. Uh, also about the importance of elections, of how democracy works. You sometimes had to go back indeed to the very basics, uh, but still uh, the fact that you explain it and you could listen also to their concerns uh, let's, or can lead to, to a good and uh, nice dialogue, definitely. Um, uh, one very last one, uh, and if there are more questions, please uh, contact us also afterwards. And if 
It's more a quick call to action. Uh, my name is Daphne. I work in DJ Act, and I work for Euro Erasmus Plus and the European Solidarity Corps. And I'm in, in particular in charge, in particularly in charge of uh, Discovery U, which is a great, which is great for young people uh, because you know it's this initiative where uh, young people aged 18 can apply to win a travel pass, an interrail pass. And in the last application round that we have twice a year on the European Youth Portal, we had uh, much less Belgians than usual, meaning that all Belgians who applied got one of, the, of two chances to, to win an interrail pass. So I think, uh, I don't, I'm not sure how to do it, but I've, pre, I've done, um, for all colleagues who ask me, I've prepared a presentation for back to school. It's really two or three slides. It's quite catchy and funky. And I, I would like to share it with everybody to really encourage all young people aged 18 to apply. And we also have nice videos. And so I think it's really, I mean, it's something really tangible. All they need to do is go online, answer five quiz questions on Europe and take that chance. So I don't know how to share this, uh, maybe on the SharePoint. Definitely on the SharePoint, and thanks for sharing it here as well. Uh, it's definitely also a topic that works well on our social media channels, so we, we try to give it uh, some visibility as well, and we'll continue doing so. Uh, now, if you allow me uh, to uh, bore you another four or five minutes just specifically on other communication uh, opportunities, because that was also a feedback we got from many colleagues that, aside from the back to school, uh, you are interested in uh, supporting us or taking up some kind of a role in, in communicating about Europe. Uh, so here, a very short menu of what you could do and how you can help us and help the Commission in, in doing this. Um, even if you're not a professional communicator, uh, as we said before, it's quite important that we show that European staff members uh, can be just very authentic, approachable, uh, personal ambassadors also of, uh, of the Commission and that you can uh, engage in, in uh, talking with, with convinced Europeans, but sometimes also with more critical audiences. Um, so we, as the Commission representation here in Brussels, we are at your disposal. Uh, we have uh, uh, quite a few actions uh, where you can participate, but obviously if you have ideas yourself or requests or you get requests from from people around you and you don't know how to start uh, uh, in, or, or, or how to accept them or, or how to, to, to deal with it, contact us and we're very happy to look at you uh, with you uh, together at, at all possible solutions. Now, what can you do? Uh, imagine you have one day to talk about Europe, imagine you have one hour, imagine you have five minutes or only one minute. Uh, if you have a full day, that's what we've just said here, uh, I think the, the back to school and back to university program is the most obvious one. Uh, so no need to go deeper into that. If you only have one hour, you don't need to travel, you don't need to go back to your uh, schools or to the schools of your kids. Uh, but you can also welcome people here in this building, in the Charlemagne building, where the Commission's Visitor Centre is. And the Commission's Visitor Centre is managed by DGCOM, and they work with a pool of Commission colleagues who are voluntary speakers for all the groups welcomed here. So there are dozens of group every week, uh, groups every week coming from everywhere in Europe and the visitor center service is actively looking for uh, more colleagues, francophone, Dutch speaking, German speaking, who can uh, be part of this pool and who can step in every now and then as often as you want and as you can uh, to welcome a group, to talk to them and to ha have a dialogue with groups of students of uh, local representatives of all kinds of clubs and associations and so on. So this is uh, absolutely something which we uh, encourage you to do. We'll send all the links also very uh, soon then in, uh, in the follow-up email that you will get. Um, another example, if you have one hour to talk about Europe, uh, maybe a good uh, tip for the winter holidays, the Christmas holidays, if you bring your friends or your family to Brussels, uh, you may know that here at the Rondpoint Schumann there is a very nice new Experience Europe Centre, uh, also a new initiative from DG Communications. It's a visitor centre, very interactive with uh, live demonstrations and videos and virtual reality and, and you name it. Uh, if you visit it, it, you can visit it seven days a week. Uh, so also in the weekends and holiday periods, it's uh, free uh, access uh, and we really encourage you to go there with your family, your friends, whenever you pass by. Uh, if you have one hour, you can do the whole tour and, and see in a very lively and nice way what the Commission is doing and also engage with the people who are there. So that's also if you have one hour. 
Another example, if you might have one spare hour, uh, in the representation we have a media team, a media team that is dealing specifically with Belgian press and media. And very often uh, we um, try to reach out to these Belgian media to talk about what Europe is doing in Belgium for Belgium. So this may go into both directions. Uh, very often when there are new initiatives, we are looking for experts uh, working in the in respective director general, uh, experts with whom we can engage and who, we can, who can help us, for instance, for background briefings for journalists, for Belgian journalists to give some background information to explain what it means, a new proposal, uh, progress on an important file, uh, to do this off the record, but just to, to give some, some background uh, in French or in Dutch. So that's a very uh, nice support you can give us. And we'll use the address list that we collected today, uh, maybe to contact some of you if you're willing to do so. Uh, proactively also towards our media, uh, team, if you are aware of things from your DG or from your agency or, or uh, the, the, the part of the house you're working for that are relevant for Belgian media, for Belgian audiences, please alert them to us. If there are newly funded initiatives that are really nice to sell uh, but that, that don't get the attention from, uh, from the media yet, flag them to us and we're very happy to take it up and to see whether we can use them on social media, whether we can make local press releases, publish them on our websites and so on. Another example what you can do, uh, Stefan just mentioned it, the Belgian presidency is starting on the 1st of January for six months, meaning that the commission, together with the parliament, we will be everywhere in the country for the next six months on plenty of public events. Uh, you will find the calendar on our website. But please, if you're around in uh, Brussels, in Ghent, in Mechelen, in Mons, uh, in, in plenty of other places uh, throughout those six months, and you see our stand uh, pass by, uh, say hello, bring your friends, bring your family, uh, and engage there again in a very uh, interactive way. And one of the examples for engaging is on the next slide, is a, uh, for instance, a whole series of video portraits we are making from People like you from Belgian colleagues working for the Commission, working for the institutions and building the European Union in daily lives. Uh, a bit going beyond the usual stereotypes of the Eurocrats who are anonymous and faceless, but showing that it's in fact about the real people with very interesting profiles, very interesting stories to tell. Um, <clears throat> If you are volunteering yourself to be part of this video uh, series, don't hesitate to contact uh, Isabel. Um, we uh, will use those at those interactive stands on screens and so on, but also online they will be used uh, and can be then further disseminated uh, through all social networks. Talking about social networks, that's if you only have five minutes to do some communications. Um, you can help us. Um, the hashtag to remember or the, uh, the account name to, to remember is EU4BE. Uh, that's the account of the Commission representation here in Belgium. It's used on Facebook, on Instagram, on YouTube, on X, uh, the former Twitter. Uh, Pinterest. And on Pinterest as well. Thank you. So whenever you see any of our posts there, it takes you two seconds to like it. It takes you uh, eight seconds, more or less, to share it. And by sharing it, you will increase the visibility of the posts. Uh, you will double it, in fact. Or it takes you maybe 10 seconds to comment on those. Uh, comment on those just by adding uh, a couple of words. And that increases also the outreach and the visibility for all this. Not only among your own followers, but also bringing it up higher in the algorithms and making the posts more successful. So you find all these. Uh, on our social media uh, accounts and to put all this into practice for those who have their smart smartphone here at hand and who are on LinkedIn. Uh, I've posted uh, like 20 minutes ago a uh, post about the fact that we're all sitting here together to promote back to school, back to university, that we have plenty of colleagues who are interested 
So uh, you can find this back if you uh, look for my name. This is not self-promotion, to be clear. Uh, <laughs> but there you can obviously like the post, but maybe even better, you can comment on the post saying that you are part of this initiative as well. So if one of your followers is interested, then they can contact you and uh, you're very happy to go to a school, to meet a, a local association, to meet a local club, whatever, uh, or wherever you want to talk about the European Union. So, here again, our website, our channels, um, do promote it, keep up the good work, and looking forward to engaging with all of you, also the colleagues uh, connected online and all the others. We will share all the presentations, all the material with you, also all the links where you can find back and register for the speaker's pool and so on. Uh, and let's make this a successful uh, communication period to the next six months and even on the longer term. Thank you very much and uh, good luck.